Hello, Full House Rewind fans. We love when you follow us. It helps keep our show strong like a bull. So go over to Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and hit that follow button. Look, we, we created a follow button for you right there. Welcome to episode 17 of Full House Rewind. I'm your host, Dave Coulier. And our guest today is none other than Kelly Rizzo. She's Bob Saget's wife, and she is one of the nicest, most genuine people I have ever met. You may know her from Eat, Travel, Rock, starring on Special Forces on Fox, and you can hear her podcast, Comfort Food with Kelly Rizzo. Here's an adorable picture of Kelly when Full House was on the air. Wow, look at that picture. How cute. Thank you so much for being here. Dave, I can't even tell you how much this means to me. This is so fun. Thank you for having me. It is so nice for you to be here on the show. And we're going to be talking about a ton of stuff. I have so many questions for you that I can't wait to dive into. But we're going to be talking about episode number 17 with you, okay. also known as Danny's Very First Date. <laughs> so episode 17 was directed by Joel Zwick. And first aired on ABC on February 12th, 1988. And so, Kelly, you're going to give us a little rundown on what this uh, episode is about. All right. So Danny has not dated anyone since his wife's death one year ago. And he becomes interested in the hive mother of Stephanie's honeybee troop. When his kids find out he might date the woman, their negative response surprises him. <laughs> Ooh, if that doesn't pull you in, huh? Oh, man. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, now we're, we're just going to describe what's happening in the episode together. So I'm going to start us off, okay? All right. Episode 17 opens in the living room where Stephanie and her group of honeybees have gathered for their honeybee honey drive. Joey, wearing a bee hat, is there to assist the hive mother, Linda, with today's meeting. DJ, a former honeybee, enters and gives the kids a pep talk about selling honey for the honeybee drive. Okay, so then Jesse and Joey try to convince Danny to ask Stephanie's hive mother, Linda, out for a date, telling him that it's been a year since Pam has passed away and it would be okay. And Danny tells the guys that he hasn't been on a date since he took Pam to prom. And Danny, trying to, con to impress Linda, buys three jars of honey from her daughter, DJ and Stephanie then talk Danny into buying 20 jars of honey. Now, Danny <laughs> tries to awkwardly ask Linda out for a date. And Linda, seeing Danny's awkwardness, shocking, asks if he'd <laughs> like to go out that night. And he agrees and tells Jesse and Joey how excited he is. Well, then Danny tries to find a way to tell the girls that he's going on a date. So Joey and Jesse try to give Danny some advice as he heads upstairs to tell them. He tells the girls, and they're obviously upset, and Danny calls Linda and cancels the date, telling her that it's just too soon for him to start dating. And then while Jesse and Joey try to build a playhouse for Michelle, they convince DJ and Stephanie that their dad is lonely and it would be best if he went on the date. DJ and Steph go upstairs and talk about whether their mom would be happy if their dad started dating. Well, the girls go to Danny's room and ask if he still loves mom. He says that he's always going to love her and nothing will ever change that. Danny explains to the girls that mom would be happy if he started dating, saying that when they were married, they actually had a conversation about this scenario, should it ever happen. Hearing this, the girls now have a better understanding and tell Danny that he should go on the date. And that is a touching full house right there. Um, you are so busy. You have so many things going on, and and I've got to be a little part of it watching you. And uh, it's it's so good to see you always. I don't get to see you enough, and my wife Melissa <laughs> doesn't get to see you enough. But you just got to got to see her. Uh, I'm going to ask you stuff that I don't know about you because we've never had the luxury of time to be able to just sit and talk, and you know get to know each other even more. So I want to start at the beginning. I'm you're very excited. You're from Chicago, which is yeah. one of my favorite places in the world. So yeah. did you start Eat Travel Rock in, in Chicago? Was that something that you started there? And and just kind of walk us through how, how that all started, because it was a web series, right? Yeah, yeah. Originally? So 
Well, first, I, I love that we're both Midwesterners, you know, <laughs> maybe why we got along in the beginning. Um, but yeah, so grew up in Chicago, lived there my whole life. And then I started Eat Travel Rock after a very long career in real estate, which a lot of people don't know and find kind of surprising. They're like, oh, because it's such a different career from what yeah, I'm doing now. certainly, yeah. So, you know, my family and I were in real estate forever. And I went through a divorce in like 2012 and was just so burnt out on real estate. I'm like, I need to reinvent myself. I want to do something totally different. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what am I passionate about? What am I good at? What do I want to talk about? And I'm like, well, food, travel, music. And I literally yeah. went online and bought eattravelrock.com and then just started blogging. But I knew I wanted to be a right. little bit more interactive, have it be more on camera. So I started doing some more videos, interviewing musicians, a lot of country artists back yeah. in the day in Chicago and um, just you know a lot of like restaurant reviews and things like that. And then it just started progressing and building a bit more. And then I met Bob and then moved to LA to do it here in 2017. So Eat Travel Rock, now I, I, I know some bits and pieces of it. It took you all over everywhere. Yeah. yeah I mean, all over the planet, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of places I, would, I, I have not been. So where is a place where you found just to be so interesting that was just like, not, not so much a culture shock from, you know, being a Midwesterner yeah. in the United States, but someplace where you just went, wow, this is really cool. It was Japan, and it was very cool on uh -huh. many levels because um, it was a culture shock, but it was also my first big international trip for Eat Travel Rock. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that it was kind of my dream to actually have to go to Japan, but then to have it be a work trip and have yeah. it be paid for and then get paid to go do what I love to do in this country that I'd been dying to go to for years was kind of a pinch me moment of like, wow, this is actually working. This is actually happening. And it was so interesting because um, I went with my videographer at the time, Ethan, well, he's still my videographer, Ethan, and Ethan had never even left the US. <laughs> and so we were going to places That's... also in Japan that were very off the beaten path, mm -hmm. places where Americans do not go and do not get right. to see and where they've never even seen Americans, really. So it was a bit of a culture shock for me, even though I was pretty well traveled, but it was really a big one for him. And so it was so fun to see his reaction to, I mean, first time having sushi and first time eating all these crazy foods. So um, to this day, that was probably my favorite trip and a great learning experience and also kind of the start of my international travels for my job. It's interesting that you say Japan because Full House is part of their culture there. Yeah. They actually taught in their grade school programs, uh, you know, th what a nuclear family looks like in America. So it became part of their curriculum. Then when we launched uh, Fuller House, we had this huge thing in Japan, which was just insane. I remember. And uh, my wife, Melissa, came with me. And she'd been to Japan a couple of times because her sister and brother-in-law lived there when he was stationed there. And we went off the beaten path like that. We got on the bullet train and went out to the countryside and went to some places like that. I found their culture, not just because we were big stars when we arrived there, I found their culture just extraordinary yeah um how neat tokyo was it was pristine like you didn't see a cigarette butt or a piece of gum on the sidewalk well, you don't everything. eat while you're walking there crazy there you eat in yeah. a designated yeah. location like there were not even garbage yeah. cans on the streets because there's no need for them because people don't mm. throw things away while they're just right. walking around it, here's another thing i found about japan which was which was really interesting it was quiet here tokyo was quiet it was a hustle bustle city cars everywhere and so you never heard a horn honk and so mel and i were there for about three days and we were walking somewhere and i think it was like to the emperor's palace and we're just walking and all of a sudden we heard a horn honk and i said to her i said somebody must have really done something wrong for someone yeah. to honk their horn yeah but the manners um, are just next level. Yes, it was it was so beautiful. And you know, they have these cemeteries right in the city. 
And, you know, they really, the relatives go there and they visit and they have these poems on these wooden sticks there that describe the person's life. And you can go and place these, these wooden sticks. It was just, um, it was a beautiful culture moment. And, and I was so happy to be um, immersed in that. Is there, is there any place that you've traveled to where you could say, I, I could live here? Um, well, first, let me just say one more thing about Japan was that trip that you guys went on, Bob wanted to take me, but he's like, I'm only going to be there. It wasn't even, he wasn't even there two full days. I think he was yeah, there he, 36 yeah. hours. Yeah, because he didn't stay. He and, came in for the big she and, shebang there. Right. And he said, it's not worth it for you to come for 36 hours. Right. And to this day, he, he had always said, because I, I really wanted to take him back so he could really experience it. Yeah. And he just, he's like, I've been to Japan. I'm like, you did not go to <laughs> I Japan. I wish you would have been you, on that you trip. You were there for 36 hours. Yeah. I said, we have to go back and you need to really, really see it. And, I, you know, obviously I'm sad we never got a chance to go, but it was, that was definitely our next kind of bucket list trip that we were going to do because he didn't really get a chance to experience it as much as you did because you had a few more days there. Yeah, yeah. The fish market, uh, we went to the, the, they have like a tuna auction in the fish market. Oh, I still haven't done So that. we went at like four in the morning. Oh, yeah, you gotta and, go early. And it was just, just crazy. People eating sushi at 5 a.m. and waiting in line to go into like a six seat sushi bar was just incredible. It's never a bad time for sushi. That's but, true. That yeah. is true. That's yeah. true. Maybe I'll, maybe that's my comfort food. <laughs> okay. You okay. Know? Maybe, I'll maybe sushi note. is, is my comfort food. I'll for get a your, sugar fish. For your, yeah. Ooh, for, okay. your, <laughs> for your podcast, maybe. Cause you asked me, what's your comfort food? And I thought, mm, it's either pizza or sushi, but now that all this talk about Japan, it's got me thinking all right, about, we'll, we'll switch it up. <laughs> um, let's see, where could I live? Yeah. Um, well, so Italy is probably my favorite country in terms of, you know, that's where my family's from. So I I love it there very much. And I love the culture and the food, of course. And I do have a lot of family there. But I think in terms of actual livability of somewhere, I mean, I speak Italian, but not perfectly fluently. <laughs> yeah. And that would be too much of a stress to live somewhere where you don't totally speak the language. So I think London. If I had to live anywhere, oh, I'd pick London. I love yeah. London. You know, everybody says, oh, you know, when you go to London, the food isn't very good. I Amazing. found it to be really good. Yeah. 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 Much, much uh, adverse to, to what I heard. So years ago, I did a show on Fox called uh, Skating with Celebrities. Okay. And, I, and it was uh, a, a figure skating competition show. And I skated. My partner was Nancy Kerrigan. This makes sense uh, for you. you know, it, with it, the well, I'm not a figure or... skater. I'm an ice hockey player, and it's a different type of skate, different blade. And what was that movie, Cutting Edge? Cutting Edge, yes. Yeah. I mean, they did it. He went yeah, from hockey that's to true. figure skating. Uh, toe pick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, toe, toe pick. pick. Yeah. Um, but it was an ice skating competition show. I think I lost close to 20 pounds. I, I was in ripped shape, but skating every day, and I thought, man, this is probably the toughest thing I have ever done because it was a lot of training um it pales in comparison to the show that you did <laughs> you did the second season of, of special forces on fox right mm -hmm. uh, that looked insane were you so I, proud of me <laughs> i was so proud of you i was uh, you know it looked like you're training to become a navy seal i mean yeah. it was the real deal yeah. um and i watched and i just i just you could feel the pain i was like in pain watching you on this show. Yeah. Um, it was how, no joke. Can you just take us through that show, why you did it, how they found you, and, and take us through that whole process? Yeah, so a little bit of background. I had always been kind of obsessed with the movie G.I. Jane, and I always yeah. thought if I ever had Demi a chance Moore. to... Yeah. yeah, if I ever had a chance to do something like that, you take that chance. You take that opportunity yeah. because just to be able to work alongside some of these incredible military personnel, people who have fought for our country, not just ours, but this was British, British special forces as well. Um, I'm like, these are amazing people yeah. who have done incredible things and I want to be trained by them. I want to work with them. Right. And when my agent brought it up and cause she had another client who had done the first season, she's like, 
I think you'd be really good on this. I think you should do this. And at first I was like, that's crazy. And of course I'm going through my head, like what would Bob say? Would he <laughs> think this is insane? Would he support it? And then I came to the conclusion that he would think it was insane, but mm -hmm. he would ultimately support it. Like, well, if that's what you want to do. I guess that's what you want to do. <laughs> so uh, it was in New Zealand and last summer, which was winter in New Zealand. And at first my agent told me, oh, you're going to Australia. And I thought, oh, Australia, it's good weather. Even if it's kind of in the winter there, it's still good weather. And then I found out, no, it's New Zealand and the Southern part of New Zealand, which was very cold. I mean, mm -hmm. snow, Yeah, very, I saw very, that on very the much show. winter. I saw so, that, yeah. Uh, it was, I fortunately was able to get there a week before filming started. So I was able to acclimate to the weather, to the time zone. I wasn't jet lagged anymore where some mm -hmm. people who were my fellow recruits showed up like the day before, which I can't even imagine. I was yeah. so happy I had about eight days to adjust. And it was 14 of us started out sleeping mm -hmm. in a military bunkhouse on military cots with yeah. no really blankets or pillows. We had a tiny little travel pillow that was this big. We had zero um, toiletries. We were allowed a toothbrush and toothpaste and mm toilet paper and then any medication, like prescription medication. Mm -hmm. uh, that was it. No shampoo, no conditioner, no brush. So it was nothing. a stinky show. It was a stinky show. It could have been, <laughs> but we had so many layers of clothing on that you couldn't, it couldn't even, escape. right, it, yeah, right, yeah, okay. exactly. So, um, you know, there were, the restrooms were outdoors. It was just like a bucket in the ground with like plywood stalls. And there was no designation between like oh. men or women. It's like everyone, you know, and you had to go with a buddy. So it was, they implemented the military buddy system. Right. So even going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, if you had to go, which, you know, people, let's say over 30, over 40, and then it happens. <laughs> uh, Me. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so I'd have to wake somebody up. Usually it was Jojo Siwa or like Tom Sandoval or something. Be like, will you come to the bathroom with me? Like in the middle of the night. Uh, and oh that's, it, it was no joke. It was very, very real. There was no, when the cameras stopped rolling, oh, here's craft services. It's like you ate what they gave you mm -hmm. when they gave it to you. And if you didn't eat, like so you didn't eat that real, day. It was the real thing. Yeah. It wasn't produced for television. Oh, no. it we was... didn't see a producer or anybody, the entire show. We were only interacting with the DS, the directing staff, which were, former Navy SEALs and British Special Forces. And those are tough cookies. Yeah. Those We've are, become friends with them since, but yeah. during the show, they are not friendly and they are not on your side. Because the dropout rate or mm -hmm. whatever you call it for Navy SEALs is super high. Yeah, like 99% or something. Yeah, yeah, like no one makes it through. Right. Yeah, you've got to be tough as nails. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Did you watch Full House before you met Bob or any of us? Was it yeah. a show that you watched? Of course. So I was a, I would say, slightly more than the occasional watch. Like maybe I hadn't seen every single episode. Maybe yeah. I'd seen like 75% of the episodes. Right. So I was um, from maybe season three on. I started watching it very regularly. Yeah. But you know, maybe it wasn't until later that even after I started dating Bob that I'd go back and like watch a couple more here and there. So I'm sure at this point I've seen them all, um, but- Because <laughs> I haven't. Yeah. I haven't. I'm uh, Doing this show is me watching these episodes. Yeah, Bob hadn't either. And yeah. he would sometimes like catch me watching an episode. He's like, you're not watching Full House, are you? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was- let's say not a super fan, like my sisters were super fans. Like they yeah. were a little bit more in that age demo yeah, where, where by the time yeah. I was in high school, I was maybe, you know, not watch. I was more maybe into Beavis and Butthead at that yeah. time. Oh, sure. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> great show. But I still, I always loved it. I mean, who didn't? Yeah. I didn't know your sisters were watched full house. Oh, yeah. I never got that from them. They were just yeah. so cool and chill and yeah. relaxed. And, um, what did Bob ever tell you? He must've told you a ton of stories about full house. Like, Stuff yeah. that happened over the years. Any, oh, yeah. Any of them stick out? Like, I mean, we have so many stories, but I'm, I'm trying to think if, if he told you anything like, you know, this happened or that happened where you just thought, oh, that's very uncharacteristic of what I would have thought happened behind the scenes. 
Well, it was... Because you do get like one picture of us on camera right. and then you meet us and we're crazy. Well, I love... <laughs> yeah, yes. I loved finding out about the relationship that you and Bob had, which preceded Full House, which a lot of people probably didn't know or don't know mm -hmm. um, that you guys had known each other since, I mean, you were a teenager and he was, I what, was, like 20, 21? I was 18, yeah. Yeah, and so. Yeah. And when he would tell me the stories of you guys <laughs> even before Full House, yeah. when he was just starting out in LA and you would come and stay with him, I was always like, wait, like I couldn't grasp the concept of that you guys knew each other before and then what that must have been like to have found out that you both got it was insane. this part. And that you're like, crazy. wait, we're already friends and now we get to yeah. work together in this capacity. Yeah, It was just so cool to me. And I always loved how he would, you know, kind of recollect even days with you prior to Full House. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And well, then, we got to we got to struggle together and we got to be successful together, you know, so it was you know, we were so tight as far as the comedy world, and you know how tiny that comedy yeah. world is. Um, even more so, it was like me and Bob and Gary Shandling. The three of us were thick as thieves, you know, and, and we would just try and out-funny each other. But I just wondered, you know, I'm sure he told you so many stories of things that happened, and I was just wondering, you know, when I was thinking about you coming on the show, I thought, I wonder what Kelly's perspective was and how it got changed by you know kind of seeing behind the curtain you know yeah and and then the other thing is that he was always very open about is that even in the beginning he and john didn't hit it off like from no. the very beginning and then of course later on they did and then post show <laughs> yeah. you guys were all best 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 friends yeah and it was so real the friendship and but to hear the stories of he'd be like well you know john was Thought he was so cool because he was a soap opera star <laughs> and he would come on and he, you know. He I was in the, the middle of those two, yeah. you know, because John would have his stuff about Bob and Bob would have his stuff about John. And I was just like, you two, just just go work it out somewhere, okay? Because I was Switzerland. Yeah. You know, I was always like, hey, John, it's cool. Just stop. And Bob, you stop, you know. But yeah, I was in the middle of those two. They were cat fighting for years and what i talked to john about recently too especially since his book came out which was very enlightening on and so yeah. many things was that john had said that even though you know he was he was younger and he was out and you know dating all these people and stuff that he was always jealous of bob being having a family and being a family man yeah where it was a little bit also the opposite where Bob was a little bit jealous of John that he was this like cool guy and got to do all these cool things. Yeah. And um, so they had this kind of mutual jealousy for each other. Oh boy, don't that I then, know it. Yeah. You know, obviously was pretty much resolved, I guess, down the road. Oh, they but, loved each other. Yeah, they you know, we were so three much. brothers. We were really brothers and and um we fought like brothers and you know, we told each other the truth and a lot of times you know, no one wanted to hear that, but we did it for each other. And it was just, it was like real brothers, you know, because there were times where we would be laughing so hard and enjoy enjoying each other's company so much, just thinking, wow, this is my best friend in the world. And then there are other times where it was like, if you don't get away from me right now, I'm going to punch you in the throat. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. Well, I remember when we even first started dating, he would, you know, constantly, you know, Bob was on his phone a lot. And he would always be, you think? yeah, he, you know, and he, his texts would uh, be a little bit verbose and a little bit long and lengthy. Yeah. And they would always end with, you know, oh, by the way, it's Bob. Yeah. And, but he would have these uh, group chats and he would yeah. show me and it would be all of you, literally all of you guys on one group chat. And he'd be like, look, Full House is real. Like we all love each other. Like we're a real family. Like we're still talking because, you know, let's say I, I watched Full House in the 90s or late 80s. But then, you know, I hadn't really, you know, it was gone for 20 plus years, whatever. I hadn't really thought about it. And then to be kind of thrown back into this world when yeah. I started dating him, being like, oh, my God, like the full house cast from the night, like they're all still best friends and still love each other. <laughs> like it was such, it was a very surreal thing for it me. Is. And then I remember um, it was <laughs> season two of Fuller House when uh, you guys all went and I went with you for the day to San Francisco to yeah. film the intro. 
Right. And it was really one of the, you know, Bob and I had only been dating maybe six months or something like that. And so it was really one of the first times that I really got to spend a lot of time with you and with John and like the rest of the cast. And just to see your dynamic off screen and to really learn more about you guys as, you know, as friends and family uh, was so funny. And I remember we were on like some bus together and on the plane on the way there, which was hilarious. You know, Bob was like taking the PA speaker yes. and making like the pilot announcements yeah, yes, to people. Yes, he was. That was a But hysterical. you were being so, so funny. I don't even remember exactly what it was. I think I have a video of it somewhere. But you were being <laughs> so funny. And Bob just kept saying to me, he's like, you don't understand. Dave is the funniest person on the planet. Dave is the funniest person I've ever met. And and I remember getting uh, to see it firsthand, finally, you know, because I would hear stories from him. Yeah, then, the unscripted stuff is always the yeah. funniest stuff, you know. But those when, were some fun memories of, oh, man. of when we all went to San Francisco. And I'm like, I, I can't, it was a very surreal moment to be like, how am I all of a sudden integrated into this family of like this yeah. show that I watched when I was a kid? It was very interesting and very cool. Well, you know, I, I wanted to have you on this episode. Talk about kind of surreal, you know, and it was, and it was, as I was watching this episode, I thought to myself, it kind of mirrors Bob's life in a, in a weird kind of way, this Full House episode. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob loved Candace and Jody and Mary Kate and Ashley, like you know, like they were his own daughters. I mean, yeah. he really adored them, and and they adored him like a fatherly figure. You know, and in this episode, Danny talks with his three daughters about how he's going to move forward. And you have a great relationship with Bob's three daughters. Yeah. Um, how are all of you moving forward? How is that? Pro I know it's been really tough yeah. for, for everyone, but it's so great that you have that relationship with, with Lara and Aubrey and, and Jenny. Um, how, how have you got, and you guys have really bonded through all of this. It's really incredible, Kelly. It's so special. And it's the thing in life at this moment that I'm the most grateful for mm -hmm. to have them. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, you've known them since before they were born, um, but they are angels, absolute yeah. angels on this earth. And I could not be more grateful for them. And it was very interesting reading this and going through th this episode. It really did have a lot of parallels because, yeah. you know, that's been something that his girls and I since day one have stuck together. Um, and everything I've done since Bob passed has been, I mean, whether it's, something so simple, something about even like when I had to move and choosing my house, um, going on special force. I mean, anything I've done, uh, I've wanted to make sure that his girls were okay with it and mm -hmm. get their blessing for everything. Yeah. And they've just been so supportive of me, so supportive of, you know, just me living life and wanting yeah. to see me happy. So they've, and like even the same thing about like dating, like going to them and asking them, you know, like 18 months after something being like, you know, maybe one day, like, you know, if that happens, yeah. could I have your blessing? And they're like, Kelly, we want you to be happy. And I'm like, really? Because I feel like your dad would not be okay with this. And they're like, <laughs> and, and I've really had to make that distinction between earthly Bob, what earthly Bob would yeah, be okay yeah. with. And, make, right. and you as, you know, his best friend of, 40 plus years, you know, it's the same thing. Like you would, you really understand the distinction between earthly Bob and making those jokes and how he was very sensitive yeah, and could yeah. be jealous and things like that to what heavenly Bob would want. And, right. The mothership. You know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And his girls really helped put that in perspective for me. Like this, he, he would want you to be happy. Like this is how you move forward. This is like, and we all do it together. I mean, you know, Aubrey and Lara, when they come to LA, like they'll stay with me. Like they yeah. stay at my house and it's, they, it's wonderful. It's, it's so what... special. And it makes as horrific and hard and sad and devastating as losing Bob was having them as a part of him mm -hmm. makes things tolerable and yeah. makes things a lot easier. And it just, and it's this added blessing that we were close before, but now yeah, we We're love so those close. girls, meaning me and, and Melissa, mm -hmm. my wife. Um, we, we love those girls. Yeah. And they're just, 
they are three angels. They are just three of the most magnificent spirits. And, you know, we were all so happy when you came into Bob's life because he wasn't a happy camper. He really wasn't. And, I mean, you were the perfect person for him. And you were always just kind of the the right amount of um, calm and composure to kind of balance Bob's frenetic pace, you know, because he was... You so know, he was, he, a, little, he was a, little, a little tough, but yeah, he wasn't yeah. always so, the easiest. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I probably haven't said it enough, but thank you for being that presence in my friend's life, you know, because thank it you. was so wonderful to be a part of that and to see my friend so happy. And, and you gave that to him, so, so thank, thank you. you. Well, thank that means you. everything coming from, coming from you, coming from the people who loved him most. And yeah, you know, he he had told me he would say all the time. He's like, if you would have met me ten years ago, you would have. He's like, you think I'm difficult now? <laughs> I was really difficult back yeah. then. And uh, he, as you know, unique of a character as he was, that's what made him so special, and that's what made him so wonderful and you know, beautiful of a human is because he was so complex yeah, and he, so different. Yeah, but he had a way of holding us all together. Yeah. And, and uh, I think, you know, when we didn't have that anymore, we were kind of like wandering around aimlessly. Like, you know, uh, there are bits that I only did with Bob where I will be driving around in my truck and I'll think of something and I'll go, and I'm, I, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I would make Bob laugh so hard yeah. right now with this, abstract weird oh, he would tell me some that, of them yeah. oh i know it was just we were you so, funny voices and characters I, I and know, things so that you would do just together. with him yeah. you know yeah. and it's like i lost half of it's like losing my right comedy arm you know but um, there's such a strong pull of to this day i i you know whether it's hearing the little voice in your head or something where you know what would bob do you know wwbd like i have that in my head all the time is <laughs> yeah you know, still a guiding force, a guiding presence of, because he was so strong in his ways and in, in his thoughts. And you just, you always knew what he would do in a certain situation or what he would say. And yeah. never, as it's funny, I had this talk very recently on my podcast with John Mayer of, of saying there's always like a Bob joke also, but we know that <laughs> yeah. we could never land it the way Bob would. So like, don't even bother saying it, right? you know, right. but even his jokes, I can still hear. I could hear where he would make them. I don't know exactly what he would say, but I could hear where he would make them and, and the gist of what he would say. Yeah. I don't dare try to do it, but um, it's nice to know that, as you said, you know, he was kind of the glue that held everybody together. In a sense, he's he still does. Yeah, and I talked about it with um, me and John and Andrea and Candace um, and Jody. We all did a, an Instagram Live, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that was so wonderful. It was wonderful. But, you know, what we came to the conclusion of was we get to talk about this. For the rest of our lives now. Yeah. And that was like the greatest gift you can get from someone, you yeah. know, is celebrating their life in a funny way the rest of your life, you know. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about your podcast? Because Please. it sounds like we both need some comfort food at this point. Please. Um, I'm going to be a guest on your on your podcast. I know, but this is and, great timing. And, you know, again, it's called Comfort Food. And it's the perfect title of, of a show, uh, for, I think for you to host. Thank you. Um, can you just just tell us what the show is about? Yeah, so you know, I'd never really been through a profound loss in my life until Bob, and I was very not well versed in the grief world, mm -hmm. and I got a crash course in it and got you mm -hmm. know hit by it with a you know by a ton of bricks and learned a lot, and I did learn. And as you know, this world very, very well as well, that it's not a topic that people really like talking about because it's mm -hmm. sad, and yeah. a bummer. Um, and it's still a little taboo. People don't always know what to say. They don't know how to say it. They don't know if they should talk about it. It's just 
kind of a topic people don't like to touch. Right, right. And it's uncomfortable. Right. For a lot of people. Right. Yeah. And for me, it's been uncomfortable not to talk about it. Like I always, b- because maybe it's specific to Bob and that he's such Mm -hmm. a big presence and everyone loves talking about Bob. It's made me always want to keep talking about Bob and I'll always want to talk about Bob. So this whole situation and losing him just kind of made me very aware of there are a lot of conversations to be had, but how can I make these conversations a little bit more palatable, a little bit easier, a little bit more comfortable for people and not have it be such a bummer. It's not like a right. grief podcast. Right. It's yeah. let's bring in my guests' favorite comfort food and have these chats that a lot of times end up being pretty funny. Yeah. You know, I've had a lot of comedians <laughs> on too, which makes yeah. these topics, um, you know, it brings a little bit more levity to them. And we talk while eating my guest's favorite comfort food. So we talk about these hard times, but in a way that makes the guests comfortable. And then ideally, helps the listener because it maybe gives them some advice on how to handle whether they they themselves are grieving mm-hmm. and lost somebody or whether they have a friend who lost somebody, how can they help their friend? So that's yeah, really the and, point. And, you know, uh, I'm going to tie it all together why it makes so much sense for me because I have always explained to people when they ask, why was Full House so successful? And I said, because it was video comfort food. Yeah. And, you know, and then I started thinking and then I learned the name of your podcast and I thought, oh, that's, that's really interesting. And then I realized Bob was kind of my video comfort. He was my comfort food because together we lost three sisters. Um, We went through a lot of tough stuff, losing people. And he was always, he just kind of got it, you know, he just kind of understood and was the first one to kind of wrap his arms around it. And, uh, you know, whether it was an audio hug with a message or a text or just, you know, you were there with him. He was he was my comfort food in a lot of ways going through that dark stuff, you know. So I'm so happy once I learned what your podcast was, I was like, wow, that's really great because we don't often talk about it. Bob and I, it was gallows humor. Right. You know, it was dark stuff where we joked our way out of it. Right. Well, he was such a grief professional because he had lost so many people. And that's why he would always tell me, you know, one day when you lose your parents or when you lose somebody, like I'm going to be there for you and I'm going to help you get through this because I'm the guy, like I know what to do. And then to lose him and then not have that support for my future losses one day. um, I'm like, all right, I don't, I feel really lost, but how can I then at least use this for good to bring in a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different advice to then help other people, so. Well, I'm so glad that you're part of our family, you know, because it was just kind of seamless, you becoming part of our world. And I know you're very close to your family. Um, Would you ever move back to Chicago, do you think? Do you ever, or or would you stay here in LA? I mean, because... I, I moved back. I said right. never, and I moved back to, to Michigan. Yeah. So, I mean, would you ever Well, never here's what never, I've learned, right? Dave. Uh, yeah. You can't plan life. Right, That's Life true. does not go according to plan. Um, as of True. now, what, after Bob passed, I kind of assumed that that's what I would be doing because I'm like, well, my whole family's there. Right. But then my family was very adamant, even my parents, who would love to have me there. They're like, no, yeah. you have to stay in L.A. That's where you're your friends are that's where bob's friends are right that's your home now and we think that that's best for you wow, and i no. agreed so as of now nice. la is my home maybe one day maybe you know yeah, yeah. we'll see but i'm just so grateful from day one you guys accepted me with open arms into your family and i know that uh even though bob isn't here it's been so wonderful to have you guys as support and i know that that will never end and i'm just yay so so honored and grateful to be a part of the Full House family. So thank well, you for forever, having me. forever, yes. And, you know, in the spirit of Bob, would you like to play a little game now? Oh, my gosh. All please. right, it's time to goof around a little bit. Okay. All right. So um, this is a game called uh, Which Daughter Said It? Okay. okay. <laughs> so on uh, episode 17, Danny talks to the three girls about their mom. Okay. So uh, we're going to take a line from the girls and see if you can match it to their character. Okay. Okay. 
So no matter how you answer these, uh, you're still going to probably win a prize. <laughs> okay. All right. So it doesn't. Lucky me. Yes, because everybody's a winner here at Full okay. House Rewind. Okay. Uh, who said that seat? This is question one. Who said that seat was made for my tushy? Uh, was it DJ, Stephanie, or Michelle? I mean, it sounds like a Michelle thing, but I'm thinking season one, episode 17. Was she old enough to say that? Hmm. Hmm. Ooh. That's some pretty good insight. Right? So was it DJ, Stephanie, or I, Michelle I, who it, said that it, seat was made for my tushy? I'm going to go with Michelle. It was It was Stephanie. Oh, it was Stephanie. It was okay, about she, she had a little bike. Oh. And uh, the honeybees no. had. The, oh. If you sold the most honey, you got you won the bike. Okay, yeah, uh, I, yeah. Okay. Michelle wasn't old enough to talk <laughs> talk yet. I don't yes, think. Yes. Yes. Okay. Question two. Who okay. goes? But you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm over right. one. But okay. All right. Question two. Who said jars of honey make wonderful birthday gifts? And your purchase is tax deductible. Talk about a honey of a deal. I think that would be DJ because ding, she, ding, ding, yeah. ding, 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 yeah. yes, because she was the previous honeybee. That's right. That's yeah. right. See, okay. I remember. Somebody's I remember. paying attention <laughs> here. Okay. Question number three. Uh, who said? Well, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> yes. Yes. You're a winner. Everyone's a winner here at Full House Rewind. So let me two out of your, three. Yes, you are not going away without oh prizes. God. Here's I'm a so cut excited. it out hat <gasps> and a cut it out. Uh, oh, wait, that's a Mr. Will. Um, you know what? That's a you Mr. Woodchuck. You know how Woodchuck. much Bob loved Mr. Woodchuck. Got, oh, he did not like Mr. Woodchuck. <laughs> so you get that. He loved Mr. Woodchuck. Wood, <laughs> Woodchuck. And you get a cut it out shirt of Mr. Woodchuck Thanks, and a cut Kate. it out hat. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm very excited. So we get to do one more thing okay. before we say goodbye because it's time for Aw, uh, Cut It Out. Oh. Cut it out. <laughs> Every episode of Full House, of course, had the you know the heartfelt scene, and uh, we've cut out a little scene here from uh, episode seventeen, and we're going to read it together, you and I. Okay, this is so exciting. I, I always play the role. Of, I always play Full the House. role of Danny. So okay, uh, and you're going to be playing the role of DJ and Stephanie. Okay, okay. I'll try to switch up my voice. We'll okay, see. here okay. we go. Danny and the girls are sitting in his bed. Okay, and Danny says, "Okay, girls, what's wrong?" Well, it's kind of hard to explain. No, it's not. DJ was wondering if you still love mom. Well, of course I still love mom. She was the first love of my life. Together we made three little miracles. I'm always going to love her. Nothing will change that. Not a date. Not even if I fall in love with someone else one day. Well, how do you think mom would feel about that? I know exactly how she would feel. You do? How? Well, moms and dads talk about all kinds of things. And one night we had a long talk about what we would do if something ever happened to one of us. And we talked about making sure you were all taken care of. And we agreed that if either one of us ever became single again, we should try to meet someone else to share our life with. So mom would be happy if you went on a date? I think she would be. She would know that I'm not looking for someone to take her place just to make a new friend. I could never forget mom. I I think about her every time I look at you, and you, and you. Well, maybe we could take you out for ice cream another night. We already had two bowls anyway. Go on your date, Dad. Oh, that's very sweet, but I, I don't think I can call Julie's mom again. I already broke our date twice. I'll call her. Uh, DJ, you, you don't have to do that. Okay, it's 555-8713. And the scene ends, and that always brings a tear to everyone's eye. Kelly, thank you so much mm -hmm. for being here. Uh, hey, you're so you. lovely. I can't wait to do your podcast, Comfort Food, and I get to see you again and spend some more time with you. Everybody, thanks to Kelly Rizzo for being here on Full House Rewind. Big applause. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. Here's some of my thoughts about episode 17. Seeing Bob in this episode talk with his three daughters about death and starting his life over was to say the least, very emotional for me. In fact, I cried. It just brought back so many memories of the Bob Saget I knew and his three real-life daughters, Aubrey, Lara, and Jenny. Except the twist in this episode is that 
their TV mother dies, not Bob. So seeing Bob speak to the three girls about death was heart-wrenching and not having ever seen this episode, I was blindsided by emotion. So here was my friend and co-star talking to his girls about a parent who had passed away. It was art doing a weird imitation of life. It also helps me understand why Full House fans have such deep affection for our show. We talked about the tough times in life, hurdles that we all face, and then we'd make you laugh and tell each other how much we loved one another. This episode was pretty cathartic for me, made me remember something that we so easily forget. Don't miss an opportunity to tell the people you care about that you love them. And I love you, Bob, and the whole cast and crew, and, and, and you, you, all the fans. I want you to know how grateful I am to feel the love and support I get from Full House fans, and I'd like nothing more than to return the favor. We'd love to hear your thoughts about Full House, so tell us about your favorite episode or just why you love the show so much. Or maybe you got a question for me, so uh, just send us an email with the link at socials at podco.us. We close every episode of Full House Rewind by giving all of you who need it a hug. So here it is, your Full House hug. Come on, bring it in. <laughs> there we go. The biggest hugger I ever knew was Bob Saget. He hugged everyone. And if you were going through a tough time, Bob was there for you. When my brother Danny took his own life in 2021, Bob was the first person who called me and left a voicemail. It was an audio hug. I love Bob and he loved me too. And I'd like to close this episode by playing that voicemail message that Bob left for me. Maybe someday you can pass along the same kind of compassion to someone you love. And that's our show, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us. I know it's not the time to call, but I'm right here, 24-7 right now, right here. I love you, Dave. I'm so sorry, Dave. I love him. I'm so sorry. So I'm here. I'm here 24-7. Just call me anytime. It doesn't have to be now. It could be a week. Whenever. I, I can just talk to you and listen. I love you so much.